Okay, now there's some things that have been in the news that I wanted to share with you. We talked about antibiotics last week and genetic engineering for antibiotics. And this was an article which was in the uh, Los Angeles Times this morning, Deadly Bacteria Defied Drugs Alarming Doctors. Uh, there's three new gram-negative bacteria, this Acinobacter pseudomonas, which is a soil bacteria of all things, and this Klebsiella pneumoniae. Uh, they're all now fairly resistant to all antibiotics. And in certain immunocompromised in populations, that is uh, older folks and uh, people with uh, you know, AIDS and other kinds of diseases, these opportunistic infections which are in hospitals are really causing a high mortality rate. Um, people are going in for very simple operations like um, a nerve pinch or something like that and they're dying. Uh, I think the rule is unless you have to go into a hospital, don't. I mean, that's really the bottom line. Uh, but I think it's clear that we need to find new antibiotics and new antibiotic creating, creating organisms. And that's where metagenomics comes in that I talked about last week, and also genetic engineering, uh, new pathways either in fungi which produce antibiotics and or bacteria. And I just simply want to point out that these things called gram-negative bacteria, of which E. coli is a gram-negative bacteria, it's a generic term. Uh, it deals with a stain, a guy by the name of Graham, not a weight, that was his name, Graham. Uh, gram negative, do not stain, gram neg positive do. You can see the positive dark blue color, that's a gram positive bacteria, gram negative, and it simply has to do with the structure of the cell wall. The gram positive bacteria uh, are a little bit simpler with respect to their cell wall structure. Here's the cell wall structure right over here, and I'm not going to go into it. Here's the inside of the cell, here's the outside of the cell, it has a carbohydrate cell wall, but it's relatively simple. And that's one of the reasons why it takes up this gram stain. Uh, here's the gram negative bacteria. The gram negative bacteria have a much stronger and a much more resilient cell wall. Uh, and it's much more sophisticated. In fact, it has an outer membrane and it has a cell wall and it has an inner membrane. And in some cases, there's a you know, a capsule around it, as we talked about with virulent and smooth bacteria. And these are the ones that are really giving a big problem. Uh, they're not so much giving a problem because of their cell wall. That's one of the reasons that they're a little bit resilient, but it's simply that they're developing resistance genes, and those resistance genes are detoxifying the antibiotic by reasons of the mechanisms that we talked about. So this is an enormously serious problem. And part of it uh, is born about because of... Uh, you know, how the plasmids transfer from bacterial to cell to bacterial cell. And we've talked about that, and it's a survival mechanism. Uh, but another part of the problem, simply not so much for this, is overprescription of antibiotics. You know, you get a cold, and it's a virus, and you go to the health center, and someone says, okay, we're going to give you an antibiotic. Well, it doesn't do a damn bit of good with a virus, as all of you know. And the second problem is, you go into the grocery store and, 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 and you can buy this soap with antibiotics in it and stuff like that, and that's really something that you don't want to have at all. And this is, as I've said, and I'm not going to preach to you guys, this is an enormous problem. Because remember, do we want to go back 100 years in time? Could you imagine living in a period in which no antibiotics would work? I mean, the kinds of diseases and the death rates would just soar enormously. And so this is where really good biology, good genomics, good genetic engineering can really play a big role. Another thing that was in the news this week was sequencing. It's really not that new. They hyped it a little bit more than they needed to. Uh, but the point here is, is sequencing uh, these rhinoviruses, which are the viruses that get into your nose, and are viruses which are uh, responsible for the common cold. Uh, it has an RNA genome. It's a small RNA. Uh, of about 8,000 bases, and they sequenced 100 different strains. And the idea is if you sequence 100 different strains of the cold virus, which varies by mutations quite a bit, they can find common, they can find common genes or common proteins to all the different variants of the genome, and then perhaps develop drugs or vaccines that can combat it. And then finally, I think that the real tour de force of last week's science news 
was the fact that now imagine, we've talked about this, imagine from just a few 40 to 50,000 year old bones, they've been able to resurrect enough DNA that they've now sequenced the entire Neanderthal genome. Isn't it the most unbelievable thing? I mean, to sequence a genome of a relative of human that haven't walked on the face of this earth for 30,000 years. And so that's a real tour de force. And all the data confirms that this was an offshoot, uh, that the Neanderthals really didn't give rise to us, and we didn't give rise to them. But we supplanted them about 30,000 years ago. Uh, but then one scientist, a guy by the name of George Church, who works for this high throughput, well, he's the CEO of this high throughput company uh, that helped with this sequencing using state-of-the-art technology, which I haven't gone into in this class. He's, he had this harebrained scheme. I don't know how harebrained it is, though. He said, well, when we get to the point in which we can synthesize a perfect large human-like genome. And remember, we talked the first day of class about synthetic biology. And remember, I discussed, well, you might not remember, but uh, I'll remind you that we discussed the fact that by using um, synthetic DNA fragments that were put together because you know the sequence of a small, in this case, mycoplasma, a very small prokaryote, by just making a whole bunch of the chromosomes of this little tiny 590,000 base pair circular mycoplasma genome, and then stitching these pieces together in yeast cells to make one giant chromosome. That's synthetic biology. You're now taking the sequence of the mycoplasma genome and using organic synthesis. This is not DNA replication. This is organic synthesis, like in a chemistry lab, piecing together in the exact sequence, the sequence of this genome, assembling it in a yeast for reasons that I'm not going to go into. And then uh, you have the whole genome. And then sticking it back into one of these little mycoplasmas that had its genome destroyed. Well, imagine that we're in the infancy of this technology of synthetic biology. And imagine what you can do with this. There's a tremendous number of applications. For example, if you want to find out what the pathogen genes are, and this is a pathogen, it's mycoplasma genitalium, it's an STD, sexually tr transmitted bacterial disease, a mycoplasma. If you want to know the pathogen, gen pathogenicity genes, you just synthesize genomes where you eliminate one gene at a time. And then you have maybe a mouse model or something like that where you have a mutant of every particular gene or whole series of genes. Uh, and then you see what they do. I mean, that's one application. Uh, but this guy, Church, who was involved in the sequencing of this uh, Neanderthal DNA, thought, well, what if we then synthesize the entire Neanderthal genome? And then what if we get to the point where we can, let's say, clone a human being or a chimpanzee with 100%, and he, he said chimpanzee. I think he was being a little bit politically correct, but let's just say humans, where you could clone with 100% correctness. Uh, why don't we try and eventually bring a Neanderthal-like primate uh, back to life? You ready? Go. Look at that. We got 21% yes. We got some adventurers in here. Who said yes? Albert. Now you have something to say. Talk into the microphone, Albert. I think it would just be really cool to have a Neanderthal. Yeah, but we're not interested in coolness, so give me some good scientific reasons. Coolness is not a good answer for something as serious like this. That's what I would call a very uncritical answer. I just really want to see a Neanderthal. But, I mean, I guess you could study kind of how they live and how it's different from how we live. So, Albert, if you put the Neanderthal genome in a human egg, um, and you're able to bring that humanoid-like creature alive, would they be a human being or would they be a Neanderthal? I mean, they're not living 50,000 years ago. Let's say you just brought them up in an environment like you were raised. What do you think the potential of that individual might be? Not as great as a human's potential. And, and well, I don't know. Do you know that? No. 
No, we don't know that. I mean, the Neanderthals lived for many, many, many tens of thousands of years. They were able to make tools. They had families. They reproduced. They were able to survive. They went from Africa into Europe. They were able to adapt. That means they had to have some intelligence. Um, they might not have had as much as the Homo sapiens that supplanted them, but no one really knows why they were supplanted. What we do know from the sequence of the Neanderthal and the Homo sapien genomes is that they didn't mate because there's no human genes that can be found inside the Neanderthal genome, at least from the bones that, of course, you can't say that from the whole population because they're just sampling a few. Uh, who else said yes? Ben. I think you just learn a lot about the evolution of humans um, just by comparing, and also, like, what genes did want, what? Like, you can find out the differences genetically between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, and if you raise Neanderthals, you can find out what differences those genes produce. Okay, what about in Davis? How did you vote? Faria? <clears throat> I said no because I just, um, this, this is from like 3,000 years ago, and I don't know. It, there could be some dangers involved, and I just I don't I didn't this feel like what? I was right. I didn't hear you. What? I just didn't feel um, what like. What did you say about the 30,000 years? No, that this they've been there for the past 50,000 years, and they're just so different than how we are right now. And unless there are like wait 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 wait. The individual that you would bring to life wasn't there 50,000 years ago. The individual that you'd bring to life is here now. But I still think that they would be really different. And I don't know, I just, I wouldn't, I just don't feel comfortable with the idea. Because they're going to be different. Yeah. OK, what about you, Dora? I agreed. Um, I said no, because there, I don't see the point of bringing it to, like, making Make a Neanderthal come like now. <laughs> I just don't see the point of having one no of doing point. it. OK, that's fair. Who else said no? Well, majority of you. Uh, let's hear from Tom. I, uh, I don't really see oh, uh, the particular purpose or if there's anything that we really need to bring them back to human existence. Mm -hmm. Like, they were kind of wiped off the evolutionary map a while ago, so they don't have anything really that much in common with us. So mm -hmm. yeah. You know that for a fact. Well, they've been gone for 4,000 or several thousand years, but, so. But, but you don't know that, though. Well, true. I don't know that. Yeah, you don't know that. Okay, who else said no? Let's hear from Rose. We haven't heard from you in a while. I, would, I said no because I feel like the only reason we'd really bring a Neanderthal back to life was to, you know, do tests on it and, like, cut its brain up and things like that. Well, we're not going to do that. Well, I feel not like... Gonna, where do you get cutting the well, brain up? For I took linguistics last quarter, and so the right-left brain thing, never mind. But um, basically, I feel like the only reason we would bring the Neanderthal back would be to, like, do tests on it, and I don't think that that's necessarily right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right for what reasons or wrong? I feel like it'd be cruel in some sense, just okay. because, I mean, to create a being, just like a full being, not necessarily just like an embryo, to like just test it and, you know, take it apart kind of mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Chris? I have a question. Uh, like, how much do we know? question is like? No. How much do we know about... Uh, Neanderthals now? Um, well, all we know about Neanderthals is from, you know, archaeology and from bones and all those other kinds of things. You don't know very much about them at all. So the application of, of this type of operation would be to study them, right? I'm asking you. I, I, I'm okay. not proposing any of this. Okay. Um, well, yeah. You I, said no, so what I said you? no originally. And I just, I thought that... Uh, Basically, uh, as Rose said, like if we were just gonna te do tests on it, that would raise issues of like informed consent. If if he had, you know, how do you know he or she, he or she had like a consciousness and whatnot. So, yeah, there's a lot of ethical issues from doing something like this. There's absolutely no question about it. 
you know, in terms of having, uh, I mean, what's the point? But, you know, raising it would be, in a sense, like a human being. You don't know what the potential would be. You certainly know one thing. Whatever this individual would be, it ain't going to be a Neanderthal like it was 50,000 years ago because it's in a totally different environment. And so whatever perhaps intellectual level they might be able to achieve, uh, and it's not going to be that much different probably than human beings, but who knows, um, will probably exceed anything that they could have imagined 50,000 years ago, just as any of us living 50,000 years ago wouldn't be able to achieve the intellectual level that we're achieving now simply because of the environment that we're in. But it raises a, a tremendous amount of, of, of ethical issues and things that we need to really consider in doing these things. Okay, let me move on uh, to uh, genetic engineering applications part two. And I think you're going to come up with some other issues today uh, which will um, complement what we're talking about. Last time I discussed uh, genetic engineering applications dealing primarily with uh, bacteria. And I discussed how bacteria are, made, are used to make drugs and vaccines and uh, antibiotic issues and all these other applications. And so now I want to move beyond that and I want to talk about, um, here's what I talked about last time as you can see, you know, new drugs using human proteins, new vaccines, new antibiotics, um, making cheese, uh, altering bacterial metabolic pathways, all of those different kinds of things. We talked about uh, using bacteria, which are fascinating. But now I want to turn to fungi. I want to turn to plants. I want to turn to animals. And then I want to wrap all of this up in terms of our scientific discussion this quarter uh, with engineering humans, that is genetic engineering humans. So the first question I have for you is that fun, fungi or molds are classified as eukaryotes, prokaryotes, both eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Go. Let's see how many of you remember your fourth grade biology. Wow. That's exactly what I thought was going to happen. That's why I asked this question. So who said that the fungi are prokaryotes? There's two of you. Who are the two brave people? Rose, <laughs> the math major here. Did you ever have biology in fourth grade? Well, you had it sometime. Yeah. OK, what was your reason for fungi being prokaryotes? What is a prokaryote, quickly? I mean, we don't want to dwell on fourth grade biology here. Did I get them mixed up? Why do I feel like I don't know. <laughs> What's a prokaryote? What's a karyotype? A karyotype. Why am I blinking so badly? Um, a prokaryote is, I, I thought it was multicell or the, the like with the nucleus and stuff, but I'm. I'm After putting, all these weeks of genetic engineering with bacteria and all that, you still think Kelly must not be doing her job. <laughs> Even though you're not in her discussion. <laughs> no. <laughs> No. You want to um, change your vote? Yes. Who was the other person? Who's going to fess up? <laughs> there were two of you. Kathy, why did you think fungi were prokaryotes? It was a mistake. How did you vote, Dora? I made a mistake, too. <laughs> <laughs> OK, what are fungi, eukaryotes or prokaryotes? OK, they're eukaryotes, absolutely. So. And they're very important ones, too, as you will see. Here we go. Genetic engineering of yeast. Um, and this is the yeast that people use to, how many of you make bread? Yeah, that's the yeast you buy, baker's yeast. Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And there it is. It's a kind of a unicellular, unicellular eukaryote. It's a eukaryote because it has a nucleus. It has you know, chromosomes that are linear. It has DNA pieces that are linear. It divides by mitosis. It does all the things that uh, eukaryotes do, but it's a very simple little creature. And because it's a simple little eukaryotic creature and can be handled just like bacteria. Kelly, tell them how you handle your yeast. 
Tell them, does it, it's kind of like what you handle. Uh, it's like your, bacteria. I can't hear. It's like bacteria, you just grow it on plates. You grow it on sure. plates, you plate it out. Looks like, do you have any of that stuff in the lab? Yes. Can you go bring some? Okay. Yeah, good. We'll show you exactly what it looks like. But the point here is that you can handle it in a very simple way. And since it's a eukaryote and you can handle it like a bacteria and grow tons of it, uh, it's very useful for genetic engineering purposes, although I'm not going to go into all the reasons why it's uh, good for genetic engineering purposes, just some of them. And also it's been used very historically, as you'll see, for some very important food and beverages of which we consume. Now, these yeasts are a certain class of mold. There's a variety of different fungi, and I'm not going to go into the taxonomy of fungi, uh, but for those of you that like mushrooms, they're called uh, basidiomycetes. Those are the fungi that you get in the grocery store and you actually eat. Uh, but these yeasts are these things called ascomycetes uh, because they produce what's called an, asc an ascus, which is kind of like a pod in which the spores in which they produce, reproduce are, are present in. And I'm not going to go through that, uh, but the point here is that there's a lot of different fungi out there. And these fungi and mold are everywhere. They're in the soil. They're inside you. I can guarantee you right now, Marvin, they're in your mouth. I guarantee you they're on your skin. I guarantee you they're floating around in this room. Uh, and in many respects, they're very important for the environment. They're very important for uh, ecology. Uh, but they're really, in many respects, deadly pathogens as well. Very deadly pathogens. As you can see from the slide, about 7,000 people died due to opportunistic fungal infections. That's human beings. And those people that succumb to uh, fungal infections are individuals, again, that were immunocompromised, generally individuals with AIDS or uh, immunorelated diseases and or elderly individuals. And the problem is that when you get these fungal infections, and others that I'll get into in a second, when you get these fungal infections, it's very difficult to get rid of them. And one of the reasons why it's very difficult to get rid of them is they are not susceptible to antibiotics. And Taylor, why is that? How come these fungi are not susceptible to antibiotics? How come you can't take penicillin and treat a fungal infection? What do you think? Yeah, and what do antibiotics generally work on? What kind of processes? We've talked about this at least twice in this class. What are the processes in which antibiotics operate on? Name at least one. It's not on the slide. It's not going to be there. I talked maybe 30 minutes on it one lecture and at least 20 minutes on another. So I know I spent 50 minutes on the mechanisms of antibiotic action and resistance. you agree with that, Aicha? Absolutely. So how do they work, Taylor? You're not doing your homework, and you must not have read your textbook because there's a beautiful figure in your textbook that deals with this. Zach, you want to help her out? This is embarrassing. How important are antibiotics to genetic engineering? How important are antibiotics to what we do? And we discussed this, so how do they work? Who's going to take a stab at this? I got Julie. I know you read your book because you asked me about 5,000 questions in office hours about every page, which is good. Go ahead. They prevent the bacteria from replicating at some level of the state. Replication, what else? What are some other? That's one part of how they work. What else? It blocks nutrients from getting into the bacteria. No, that's not true. It stops the bacteria cell from letting it divide. So it stops comes. making a cell wall. That's the second thing. What else? What else are the antibiotics? So that's two targets, cell wall biosynthesis and replication of the DNA. What else? Stops translation. Stops translation. That's a third one. What's the fourth one? It stops the cell from secreting. No. It has nothing to do with any of this cell biology stuff. Uh-uh. What's a fourth one? Eric? Um, it interrupts
certain enzymatic pathways no. specific to the, no. oh, okay. Brian? Who's got their textbook? Can you look up a figure in there on antibiotics? It stops transcription. Yeah, exactly. So Taylor, you just have to think about the critical processes in a cell, and when you think about that relative to genetics, that should be the targets for antibiotics. Sort of reason it out. The point here is, is that although these processes are similar in bacteria and in eukaryotes, um, there are details that are different. And those details uh, prevent these antibiotics from uh, altering your cells. What would happen, Katie, if antibiotics affected eukaryotic cells? Would you be able to take any of them? No, because... Yeah, exactly. You wouldn't be able to use them. So they obviously don't affect eukaryotic cells. And by the way, Taylor, penicillin is produced from a mold, which is a eukaryote. It's called penicillium. So the point here is, is that one can uh, get antibiotics from fungi, but they're uh, eukaryotes. Um, there's some other fungal infections that some of you don't know about. If you can look down in the corner here, um, that's a yeast infection in someone's mouth. Um, that's exactly what it would look like in someone's vagina if they had a very serious yeast infection. And one of the reasons why one gets a vaginal yeast infection and has to run to the drugstore and get monostat or something like that is that if you're taking antibiotics and or steroids, it alters your bacterial composition in your body. And by altering the good bacteria that keep the fungi that are always there in check, they start growing out of check and you get a fungal infection of some particular point. On the other hand, if it infects your lungs or gets inside of you and it's uncontrolled, it's going to be a really big deal. And antifungal drugs are powerful. These are not fun things to take uh, because, remember, an antifungal drug is acting on a eukaryote, and your cells are eukaryotic. And therefore, it's a balance between how much of the drug can get the fungus and how much, uh, you know, will get you. And um, this is one of the most common causes of death in AIDS patients, um, opportunistic fungal infections. And these fungi, by the way, have these hyphae like this. This is a fungal hypha in some cells. These happen to be vaginal cells. Imagine these things growing throughout all of your lungs in big masses and throughout your body, and it just can't be stopped. So these things are pretty serious stuff. Uh, they're also powerful pathogens for crops. And as you can see, this is a control field. Here's soybeans. Here's a rust-infected uh, soybean field. And at one point, I was doing something for agriculture. I was making a documentary on agriculture for television. And I asked some farmers, if they had all the technology in the world, what's the one thing that they would want to have? And they said fungal resistance, because that's the thing that kills their crop more than anything. And you can see that these fungi in this control field completely wiped out this soybean crop. And I'm going to come back to that uh, in a minute. And you can see that uh, discovering some of these DNAs uh, to be able to mark these genes has been a big, huge, huge, huge breakthrough. Could I have a microphone for Eden and Rose and Brian? And could you guys come to the whiteboard? Brian? Maybe there's only, is there two, three microphones? Very simply, I'd like you to design an experiment to use this DNA marker for a soybean rust-resistant gene in a breeding program to breed for rust-resistant varieties of soybeans. How would you go about doing that? Well, first you have the gene and you have some marker, how would you go about using this in a breeding program to try and find all the different kinds of, let's say, rust-resistant soybean that you could find? What would you do? We already have the genes. We don't need to send it to the library. So what would you do? Write it on the board. Okay. You know what a marker Our is. Fungus? Do you know what a marker is? Yes. This is a plant gene. Right. Our so what's a marker? 
A marker is something like an RFLP or SMP that um, it goes along with the dean. Okay, do you agree with that, Brian? Yeah. Do you agree with that, Rose? Uh -huh. Okay, so how would you use these markers in order to, let's say, breed a soybean plant that would not be susceptible to this particular fungus? How would you do that? Our, um, fungus I'm not going to answer any questions. So how would you do that? What's your experiment? Design the experiment. And Dora and Faria, I think you should be thinking about this too because I'm going to come back to you in a minute. How would you use these DNA markers? You should all be able to answer this in a relatively simple way. I might ask you this on your final exam, actually. This is a very, very straightforward, it's just trying to make a leap from things that you're very comfortable with to something that you're not comfortable with. Okay, what's the answer? Let's go. What's the first step? Okay, well, Number one, what's your first step? With black, not red, okay. can't see red. What's the first step? <laughs> You're working with some population of plants? Is it, you know, some family of plants? What, what are you starting with? Well, we would start with the soybean yes. plant. Which soybean plant are you going to start with in a breeding program? The resistant one. Yeah, so you start <laughs> with the resistant one. And what are you going to do with the resistant ones? Um, digest the... Um, what are you going to do with the, the resistant DNA. ones? We'll digest the DNA. Of no, no, no. Resistant. What are you going to do with the resistant ones? Are all the other soybeans resistant? No. What no. are you trying to accomplish? Resistant soybeans? <laughs> You're trying to do what, though? We're trying to get resistance to the other ones. Yeah, trying to get them into the ones that are sensitive. You want to get the gene. So what are you going to do? What's the first thing that you're going to do? Get it. Could you... Ah, come on, guys. Digest? You work with pedigrees the whole quarter. What are you guys going to do? Digest the DNA of the resistant gene, then put it on a particle gun, and then get little clips of the um, non-resistant genes, and then put Can't it do any genetic engineering in this experiment. Well, then you would just take two types of resistant soybean and mate them, right? If you're doing classical breeding? Two types of resistant, or? No, one resistant, one not resistant. Can you write that uh, on the board? Thank you. Good job. So you're going to do some breeding here, right? You're going to take a resist. The soybeans breed with soybeans? Yes. Oh, so, okay, so now you're going to take this resistant variety and you're going to, you're going to mate it with the sensitive variety. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, yes. because soybeans <laughs> grow all over the world. You know, there's different varieties everywhere. So you got to, okay, so now what are you going to do? So now we made a cross. Got a whole bunch of pods with some seeds. Perform gel electrophoresis to figure out which ones have the resistant gene. Well, tell me exactly what you're going to do. You're going to take a gel electrophoresis on the plant, Eden? No. We're um, going to take and grind up the plant and run a gel on the plant? No, you're going to put, we're going to take the soybean at the top of the gel and it's going to move? <laughs> no. What, what are we doing here? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take the DNA. Um, I Out the, of what? I don't know. You made I a cross. I haven't even you, seen. What's the result of the cross? I haven't seen any results of the cross. Okay, and then. <laughs> How about P plus Q? Uh oh. Do we know if it's dominant or if it's do where you can do? I haven't seen the results of the cross yet. Well, you need to perform gel electrophoresis to on the cr on the offspring. On the offspring to understand if it has a okay, marker. Okay, so we're going to take the soybean offspring. We're going to take the seeds. The DNA of the we're seeds. We're going to take the seeds and we're going to run gels on the seeds. On Am the I correct? <laughs> <laughs> what I'm trying to get you guys to do is to think about pedigrees and think about it. What I'm trying to do is get you out of a comfort zone in which I could show you a graph and you can interpret it into a place where it's exactly the same, but it's a different situation so that you can make a leap from something that you know into an unknown situation. We can, we can test for the, the genotype. You still haven't shown me here what's the, off, what, what's the result. Okay. We have seeds. <laughs> OK, so what's the next step? What are you going to do with those seeds? Grow them. Oh, so now we're going to grow them up. OK, so why don't you say that? I, I just did. Um. <laughs> what's the second step here? OK. Um, what's the second step? You guys well, are used to this. You go one, two. 
Don't they do this all the time, Daisy? Am I wrong? Plant seeds, you gotta get a plant. And what's happening to those resistant and non-resistant alleles in those seeds? The resistant and non-resistant alleles, al alleles uh, the, the genotype will manifest itself in a phenotype of... What are they doing? Are they... What if it's big A and little a? Well, they're cross, crossing. What, I don't remember the vocabulary here. What are they doing, Brian? They're crossing. <laughs> Well, they're mixing and then they're segregating from each other. And remember, P, Q, P, Q, P squared plus 2, P, Q plus Q squared. They're coming together in zygotes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you grow the plants. Where are the little seeds? I don't see the seeds. There they are. <laughs> okay. Let's say resistant is big R and small r. What could they possibly be? Maybe you started out with something like this and you crossed yeah. it with something like that and you had something like that. You crossed it together. What are you going to wind up with? Yeah, okay. There you go. Now we're on the right path here. Okay, so you can have a variety of different creatures here, right? And then if you so get now what are you going to do? What's your third step? You just grew the plants. Well, after we grow the plants, we can then check for the phenotype by Write it down. Sorry. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we're introducing something into them? I thought they already were there. Why are you introducing anything into them? Introducing the rust oh, fungus? You're introducing the rust? To check for whether or not the gene is well, present. Okay. I'm glad that you said that. The point here is, is that you don't need to introduce the rust. For what reason, Lauren? What do you have in your hands? You have the marker. So why do you even need, what are you going to do? Start getting a fungal infection in a field someplace? You have the marker. Okay, well then, can't you, well, I don't well, what understand you why do? you kept interrupting me when I was saying you can do, um, isolate the DNA of the seeds and then perform gel electrophoresis to identify the marker, which ones have the marker, because the ones that have the marker have, will have the gene. Resistance. But now you just destroyed your seeds. So now you're left with nothing. But then you... We want them but, to grow, and then you can take the DNA out of them. Out of, out of what? Out of what? What are you going to take you're out gonna of them? You're going to rip oh. off a leaf. Yeah, you're going to rip off a leaf. So and then you're going to isolate the DNA. DNA. And then you're going to, well, you're going to perform on the DNA. Well, you have to you're going to perform electrophoresis. How many, how many fragments will you get? If you, you know, how many DNA fragments might you get on the DNA if it's like, I mean. A lot. Yeah, so how are you going to see your marker? We can do PCR. How do you do that, Brian? Um, yeah, you have the primer for the specific marker. And then Thank you. make sure it amplifies. Thank you. See, it's not that difficult, Rose. That's no different than doing DNA fingerprints and pedigrees. It's just starting off and making your own pedigree to begin with in a different situation. So the point here is, is that you can use the marker to assist you when you're trying to induce. You know that there's a resistant variety. You now have a resistance gene. You know what the gene is. And now you want to introduce it in sensitive varieties to this rust. And you make crosses between this variety that's resistant and the ones that are sensitive. You get the offspring in a field. You start testing them, and you find the ones which are, let's say, homozygous for the um, dominant. Let's say it is dominant in a sense, um, at least for the large R rust resistant allele. And then you kill off all the other plants that you don't want uh, because they may be sensitive to the rust. And now you're done. And so there you have a procedure using markers to assist you in breeding for a very important trait. Uh, and in fact, fungi, as I will tell you in a few minutes, and, and pathogens is one of the biggest uh, reduction, causes one of the biggest reductions in yield in all of agriculture all over the world. It's a disaster uh, in terms of reducing food production. And so this is called marker-assisted breeding. You're using a marker to introduce something into another variety, and you're following the marker by breeding, and therefore, thanks, guys, you did a good job. Uh, that's a big deal. 
Okay, so let me go back. As I said, fungi are these eukaryotes. Uh, these fungi can be devastating pathogens in humans, uh, animals, and in plants. Uh, and then uh, they can be used for genetic engineering purposes for a variety of different things. Uh, one of the things that I'll come to is that in terms of genetic engineering, yeasts, these baker's yeasts, are the ones that are really the workhorses. So if you're talking about genetic engineering with fungi, you're really talking about genetic engineering of yeast. And furthermore, genetic engineering of yeasts are powerful uh, because indeed, as I said, they are eukaryotes. And one of the things, and I'm not going to talk very much about this, is that you can use these yeasts, like a bacteria, as a cell type with vectors in them to, let's say, clone large DNA fragments. And so unlike plasmid vectors and bacteria, which can only handle, you know, five or 6,000 base pairs of DNA, as I'll show you in a few seconds, you can construct in yeast using genetic engineering artificial chromosomes that behave like chromosomes. Uh, you, you're engineering them, essentially, using genetic engineering procedures. And then by using these artificial chromosomes, you can insert pieces of DNA that are 100 to 200,000 base pairs in length. And remember, we talked about making genome libraries. And remember, we talked about the longer the fragment, the fewer the clones you need in a library in order to manipulate DNA. So for the Human Genome Project, most of the clones in the early stages were not made in bacteria. They were made in yeast, because again, it's single cells, and you can get clones as the plate is being passed around. And the reason they were used is because you could clone 200,000 base pair fragments of the human genome. And therefore, in order to cover the human genome with respect to clones, you didn't need that many, where you'd need millions of them in bacteria. And I'm going to come back to that point in a second. From the point of view of using fungi to make drugs, the advantage of fungi is they're like eukaryotes, as I've said. And that means they do these post-translational modifications, just as you've been reading about. And I'll talk again with goats and sheep and pigs and doing all the things that you discussed in discussion last week. Uh, yeast do these things, too. And so if you have a drug that's a protein in humans and it happens to be modified after it's made, bacteria, as you know, do not do that, but yeast do. So in many respects, you can handle the yeast in a big fermenter, like a bacteria. You can grow millions, billions of cells. And you can then, if you clone, let's say, a factor VIII gene in a yeast now, you can essentially make a lot of factor VIII or protein C, which is modified correctly, just as it would be in humans. And then you can handle these little microbial eukaryotes, just like you would bacteria and be able to do all the things that you'd want. And so they have tremendous advantages in terms of making proteins like humans uh, that are modified like those human proteins. Is that clear, Dora? Yeah. OK, so one uses yeast in terms of genetic engineering. One uses yeast in many respects like bacteria in those situations in which you want to clone very large pieces of DNA, like from the human genome, or you want to actually make drugs, and you want those drugs to be very human-like, you can do that in a yeast and handle them just like a bacteria. And as I said, coming back to this, uh, one can use these yeast uh, as a cell with vectors in them. And these vectors, here's a vector. Uh, that has a certain property, just like plasmids and the other things that we've talked about, like the lambda virus or the plasmids, which are the type of vectors that we've talked about in this class. The yeast, you can make a vector, but this vector is a chromosome. It's called a YAC, Y-A-C, yeast artificial chromosome. And the reason it's a yeast artificial chromosome is remember I said, Ben, that everything in biology is modular. And there's modules on chromosomes. It's a module for the ends of chromosomes. There's a module for this little centromere where the chromosomes stick together. Uh, there's modules for the origins of replication. And all of these modules can be identified. 
by using recombinant DNA and sequencing and a variety of different processes. But if you know what they are, you can piece them all together. And so one can engineer a chromosome. And one engineers a chromosome by engineering the DNA to have the ends of the chromosome, which are a specific sequence. Engineering the, chrom the let's say, this vector to have the centromere, which is that little constriction at the middle of a chromosome. And you put origins or replication on it. And so what you can see here is, is that here are the ends of the chromosome. They have a name. It's not important what they are. Here's that little constriction called the centromere. These are all individual sequences that can be cloned separately. And you can then patch them all together, and you can make a DNA that behaves in a eukaryote just like a chromosome. And people have done this not only with yeast. People have done this with mice. People have done this with human cell cultures. And it's a way in which you can make a vector and put a lot of DNA in it. And it's handled by a eukaryotic cell just as if it's an extra chromosome. It's not recognized any differently. And so again, this is another example of just using normal biological processes to do whatever you want. Tom, do you understand that in terms of what I said? Now, in terms of being a vector, though, this vector in yeast, this yeast artificial chromosome, not only has the little things on it that make it a yeast chromosome, but it also has selectable markers, because all vectors have to have selectable markers. But it also has some other things. This thing also has sequences that allow it to replicate in bacteria. So it's a whole engineered piece of DNA. It can replicate in a eukaryote, the yeast. It can also replicate in a bacteria, because it has two different kinds of origins of replication. It'll have a selectable marker for yeast. And I'm not going to go into what it is. And it'll have a selectable marker for E. coli. And generally, it's antibiotic resistance, which won't work in a eukaryote. So you can make these things to be able to replicate in a eukaryote yeast. But when you're cloning all this stuff, you're generally cloning them sometimes in bacteria, piecing them together in bacteria. So we have a vector which can work in a bacteria, work in a yeast. And that's a product of genetic engineering. You could never do this before. Because we're having two different kinds of organisms in which we've made something that can essentially behave as if it's a DNA fragment that can be handled uh, by both of these creatures. Eric, do you understand that? Hmm? Do you? Conceptually? Good. OK. Now, if you look on the board, you look at all these different metabolic pathways. And I've showed this before. And remember that these are all the things that are carrying out all of your chemical reactions. Kathy's a chemist. And this is really what makes you you. It's just chemistry. And so these are all the different chemical reactions that take part uh, in a, let's say, typical cell. And these are all the different pathways that take part. And all of these pathways are allowed to happen because they're catalyzed by enzymes. And enzymes, of course, are proteins. And generally, they're encoded by genes. And so therefore, genes, in a sense, control all of metabolism. And I've said this before, but it con they control it indirectly, meaning they're encoding the enzyme. And the enzyme's carrying out these metabolic pathways. And in fact, the first disorders that were genetic disorders in humans were discovered by a guy by the name of Garod, G-A-R-R-O-D way back in the early part of the 20th century. And Garad wrote a big book, which he called Inborn Errors of Metabolism, in which he correlated, once Mendel's laws were rediscovered, he correlated genetic diseases in man, such as phenylketonuria, which is a defect in the production of an amino acid, phenylalanine, where he correlated those with the loss of a particular enzyme. And he said, in a sense, that genes specify enzymes in a fairly primitive way. The point here is, is that all the enzymes that are involved in energy production are right over here. And yeast are very important from this point of view, as I'll show you in a second. So if you look and see this little circle here, that's very important for energy production. And if you look at this little thing called ATP, that's very important for energy production. And all of those are driven those metabolic pathways, Anna, by enzymes. And all those enzymes are encoded by genes. And if you have defects in these genes, it's, you're in big trouble.
because obviously if you have defects in genes that are involved in energy production, the cell can't survive and in many cases uh, they can be lethal. You'll see where I'm going in a second. All energy is ultimately derived from the sun through photosynthesis, which I'm not going to go into, in which the plant, the green parts of the plant, take sun's energy, convert it from solar energy into stored chemical energy in sugars. And then, of course, creatures eat the plants, and then we eat the creatures that eat the plants, and the sugars that are made in the plants that are broken down in us and in other creatures into energy production. Why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you all this because this process can go in two directions. If it goes in this direction, you make energy in the form of this ATP, and we have to have that. It happens in all of your cells. If it goes in the absence of oxygen, it goes into this thing called fermentation. And the end result of fermentation anaerobic respiration is either lactic acid, which is the pain you get in your side. Ingrid, you have a question? Which is the pain that you get in your side when you're running? How many people have had pain when they go running? That's lactic acid buildup in your muscles. That's due to not breathing and getting enough oxygen into your muscle cells so that lactic acid is being built up and that causes uh, pain because the muscles want oxygen in order to contract do the things that you're doing. So in the absence of oxygen, things go into this direction and ultimately it can be lactic acid or ethanol. And that's where I'm going. Lactic acid or ethanol, but on this side, it's energy. And furthermore, we talked about the mitochondria. We talked about human diseases that are due to mutations in mitochondrial genes. Remember that, Tiger? Maternal inheritance? Yeah. Well, if you have mutations in mitochondrial genes, some of which can lead to very serious human genetic disorders. These mutations are encoding enzymes that are leading to this ATP production uh, when oxygen is present. In other words, what I'm saying here is that many of the genes in the mitochondria contribute to this process. And if they're defective, that process can't occur very well, and sometimes it can lead to human genetic disorders. Okay? The point here is, is that the enzymes that lead up to and feed into the mitochondria, chemicals, occur in the cytoplasm. And in yeast, along with human cells and all other eukaryotic cells, these enzymes are encoded by the nuclear genome. And then many of the enzymes that perform this little process, which is where your energy is made in the mitochondria, many of those enzymes are encoded by the mitochondrial genome. And that's an oxygen-dependent process. And that's why we breathe all the time, because we're funneling these chemicals in our cells from our lungs into other parts of the cells, eventually getting them from this, that circle I pointed out, into the mitochondria to make energy. In the absence of oxygen, we make either this lactic acid or alcohol. And why am I talking about yeast? because yeast fermentation is historically enormously important in food and beverage formation. Notice on this slide that all the anaerobic respiration, meaning fermentation, is on the right side of this slide. Forget this side where all the oxidative respiration is occurring. And under anaerobic conditions, we get CO2 off for bread rising. And that's why bread rises in the presence of yeast, because it's starting to ferment and give off CO2, which is part of the chemical process. We have the CO2 in champagne, uh, because yeast are involved in alcoholic beverage. All alcoholic beverage formation, no matter what it is, is dependent upon fermentation of yeast. And so the CO2 in champagne is because of CO2 given off in this particular process. And then eventually, you can see you can get vinegar, which I'm not going to go into, or alcoholic beverages. That is a result of fermentation, anaerobic respiration from yeast, whether it's wine, bourbon, beer, or whatever. I'm not going to ask you the question, but if any of you have drank too much, which I hope you haven't, um, and if you've gotten a hangover the next day, 
The reason for it is not due to the ethanol. I know that you probably think it's due to the alcohol, but it's not. It's due to the aldehydes. It's due to contaminants in the alcohol because of this particular process. And if you ever get a hangover from wine, not a good bottle of wine, but let's say a bad bottle of wine, it's because there's a lot of aldehydes that have not been taken out of the process. And we don't like aldehydes very much. And that's what actually gets you sick. The point here is, is that yeast plays a huge role historically in alcohol production or bread production. And the idea then is to be able to eventually engineer these yeast in some different ways genetically so that one can either make a higher alcohol content or a lower alcohol content, depending upon the extent of the fermentation. And why is that important? It's important because no matter what yeast strain you have, you can't get the alcohol content above 18 to 25%. And that's because the yeast won't survive. And so the idea then is perhaps one could use genetic engineering in order to either have yeast that can function well in a lower alcohol content, or let's say produce lower amounts of alcohol in this fermentation process, and or make a higher content of alcohol so one could adjust this uh, by engineering the pathways involved in either wine production, uh, bourbon, whiskey production, champagne, whatever. And there's a lot of literature on engineering yeast strains uh, in order to do these different kinds of things by altering, of course, using genetic engineering to alter these particular pathways or alter other pathways in the yeast uh, which would be susceptible to higher ethanol concentrations. Now, you're not going to be seeing any of these things on your grocery store shelf. Um, and the reason why is that simply uh, most of the manufacturers of these beverages uh, don't want to advertise that they're using genetically engineered yeast in order to be able to do this kind of thing. And so, in general, although the technology is very powerful for being able to alter these different processes, um, it's not really uh, being used. And that's why I said, why isn't there GMO wine or beer with higher or lower alcohol content and or new flavors? Um, and that's because of the, let's say, controversy that may uh, surround these kinds of things. But it's a powerful technology. And it's certainly powerful from the point of view of making drugs in yeast. And it's certainly powerful, Chris, from the point of view of being able to clone large eukaryotic DNA fragments. And it's enormously powerful in being able to do all kinds of things. How about animals? OK. Let's talk about the most important use of genetic engineering in animals, and it's not goats and it's not sheep, and it's not pigs, and it's not horses, and it's not cattle. It happens to be mice. This is probably the most important use of genetic engineering in animals because the mouse is one of our closest relatives that can be used as a model for studying human disease genes. And we've talked a little bit about this. Uh, I'm not going to go into the mouse, but I mean, it is powerful, powerful in terms of being able to make disease models, in terms of being able to manipulate and understand the function of human genes. As you can see here, uh, the genome's been sequenced. You can see it's 99% related to humans. And furthermore, if you look at human chromosomes and you look at all the colors on these chromosomes in which you can find blocks of mice genes in the same order. Remember we talked about this when I talked about comparative genomics? I said you can look in mammalian chromosomes and you can find a string of genes A, B, C, D, E, F, G that are in, let's say, the chimpanzee. And the same order of those genes is found in humans. Well, it's the same with the mouse. In reality, we're not that different than a mouse in terms of how we reproduce, in terms of the genes that we have, a variety of different things. So if one can find the relevant disease gene or the relevant gene of humans in a mouse, one can theoretically then study what that gene does. And so remember, I'm just reminding you that there's 25,000 genes in the human genome. We talked about that. And in terms of the disease genes, uh, only about 3,000 correlate with a particular phenotype that we understand. 
and there's many hundreds of others disease genes, many others of disease genes uh, which we don't really know what they do. We know that there's a disease, we know there's a gene, but we don't know what it does, and mice would be a beautiful model for being able to study the function of that gene. Furthermore, we might want to know how a disease functions in a mammal and how it develops, even though we know what the gene is and what it does, and so one would like to be able to study it in the mouse by making in this mice a model for diabetes, a model for, let's say, uh, factor VIII deficiency, hemophilia, a model for uh, cystic fibrosis, a model for any particular disease that you can imagine, and being able to study in this mouse might give some understanding of the basis of the disease and might help in therefore impacting a treatment or a cure. Is that clear, Nancy? Clear? Okay. 